Around the world, there are more than 700 organizations devoted to cancer research. Seastone is one of them. Um, the side effects is really you have a dry mouth. I traveled to Beijing to meet Frank to find out how he started on this journey to cure cancer. When I was very young, I lived in a neighborhood where um, there are a lot of uh, physicians scientists working at medical school and the hospitals. Um, you know, talking to them just randomly and learn a lot of stories about how saving lives and making people uh, feel better. Um, I initially thought it was just cool. And uh, if I were to grow up, and uh, I want to be part of that. Um, so the interest really started from, you know, helping people, seeing, relieving the pain from the patient, and uh, eventually, um, you know, they feel better. Um, when you actually get to the medical school, uh, it's not just a cool part. It's a tremendous responsibility that you have. And you know, patients' life, their families' well-being is all in your hand, so to speak. What was the most difficult part of that, and what was the most rewarding for you once you really entered it? Yeah. So when you, in, 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 in the, in the uh, daily treatment with patients or encounter with patients in the clinic or in the ward, that... Um, when you see a, a very sick patient come in and after your treatment, you're providing help, your approach to that patient, uh, he gets better and he eventually discharged from the hospital and have a, uh, a normal life. And that's obviously the most rewarding that you have. You hope that uh, you know, you've done something to that part. And obviously the challenge part is that uh, when, whenever we are uh, seeing patients come in and they have these uh, deadly disease, cancer for example, and you know you tried everything. You tried uh, all the knowledge you have. You consulted the best people that you know of, and you, you provide medicine you have um, available for that patient. Um, but you find that uh, you know we just uh, short of um, a miracle to save that patient's life. And this is probably part of the reason that I started to uh, really thinking of the research part to find a better medicine, a hopefully one day, a miracle medicine. Frank has more than 25 years of clinical research experience in the United States, Canada, and China. He received his medical degree from Nanjing Medical University and his PhD in immunology and biochemistry from the University of British Columbia. Frank started Seastone in 2015, which is devoted to developing new drugs for cancer. His latest treatment? Immunotherapy. This has been hailed as a miracle medicine, using the body's own immune system to fight cancer cells. Seastone is one of many companies developing these types of inhibitor prescription drugs. About three, four years ago, people started to think, well, I mean, we have, normal people have cancer cells every day. Well, we don't develop cancer. There must be something else is going on here. Our own immune system, our own defense system. It's, uh, it's called immuno, um, immun immuno immunity. So the major immunity is a T cell or a lymphocyte, or one, one of the things. So, so we we're saying, can we uh, find out what happened in the uh, cancer environment? Why our immune system is not working as what they should be? It turns out to be that uh, um, when you have cancer, in, in many cases, cancer develops something very um, tricky. They develop a break. The break is uh, uh, tapped on our immune cell, T cells. Therefore, our T cells not working. So therefore, they can grow and cancer can do all the badness thing. So we identify which is the break. The break is a PD-1, PD-L1. So this is just the most recent, it's very popular. Um, and if you can find an inhibitor, antidote of PD-1, PD-L1, therefore you unleash the break and T cell become, become strong and then they kill. Yes. And uh, for the very first time, like this is very exciting, for the very first time, there are in certain cancer with PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitor, patients get uh, totally cured. Cancer are gone. Um, and uh, so that's number one. The feature is that some of the cancer, uh, obviously, 
Unfortunately, it's not 100%, like we're talking about 20% of the people who are benefited, but those benefits are real. This has never happened with chemo surgery. Now, secondly, the breadth of the cancer type, it's not just one or two, it's like a 30. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration has approved six of these types of immunotherapy drugs to treat 14 types of cancer as of 2019. China has approved five. Seastone is testing new versions of these protein inhibitor drugs. In one of its clinical trials on esophageal cancer, nearly 78% of patients saw their cancer shrink in size. And while the process to develop a new drug in China has become more efficient, it is still a costly and time-consuming one. So you have 15 oncology drugs right now that you're working on, is that right? Right, so 10 of those are already in the, uh, in the clinic. Uh, five of those are in the, what we call late stage clinical trials, in the registration trials. And therefore, um, if they were successful, and they will be um, put on a uh, new drug application, and uh, usually a year or so after that will be launched in the market. So is it interesting because sometimes you, you think this is the one, this is the one, and then maybe it's the one you don't think is going to be the big hit, and then it becomes the hit? Yeah, so uh, in, in most cases, uh, uh, we, we know that uh, um, the cancer type that you're working on, uh, if that becomes successful, for example, lung cancer I mentioned to you, we are working on stage four lung cancer as a first line therapy using our pdl one combined with the chemotherapy. Now, if that one becomes successful, um, it's, going to, it's going to be a huge um, uh, uh, number of patients that will be benefited. And we're, we're um, anticipating the top line results the third quarter uh, next year. Mm. Uh, there are some smaller uh, indications. For example, we're also working on a very specialized, it's called the uh, NKT lymphoma. And uh, it's altogether about 39. 100 cases a year in China. But uh, the fact that we have seen very interesting response rate from uh, uh, patients on this drug, uh, we were very uh, exciting. So we wouldn't be surprised the, the market for that will be extremely small, but still um, answering the uh, medical needs. It's so interesting listening to you and the passion that you bring uh, talking about this. If I'm watching this at home though, uh, and I've got one of these cancers, I want this now. The process is a lengthy one though, isn't it? Um, it you see the promise, and yet before it can actually go to market and actually, you know, where a, a number of people can benefit, it, you do have to go through the regulatory steps and all of that. It, it can take a time. Well, uh, it, it is very true. So the uh, innovative drug development, the industry is, uh, uh, first of all, uh, very lengthy. It turns, it turns uh, 10 to 15 years to get a, to an idea all the way to the uh, drug development. Secondly, today uh, it's um, already 2 billion US dollar for the overall process. And thirdly, uh, probably 10,000 molecules start with, get one molecule onto the market. So it's a high risk, lengthy process, and uh, very expensive. Usually the excitement is starting even before human. You know, I mean, we, we can't be fooled, of course. You know, people from research have said, oh my God, we developed this animal model, a lung cancer, we have this fantastic drug, and we give an injection, second day, gone. Oh my God, this must be cured, this must be something. So, so, so there is that excitement. And then all the hospitals, all the investigators are very interested in working with that particular company. And uh, uh, usually the true excitement is on what we call phase two. It's called the proof of concept. So you're going through the early phase and then you dose patient at a, at a level whereby you know that's the right level. And then you line up patients there. Let's just say, for example, a deadly disease, um, let's just say pancreatic cancer. I mean, with normal therapy, this patient already failed all of them. And if you like 10 of, line, then 10 of them are there, you give whatever, they should all die. Uh, let's just say in a simple way. Now, if you give this new medicine and uh, one of them stand up, 
There must be something happening. If two of them stand up, I was uh, usually called, well, you, you, you got lottery, right? If three of them stand up, you, you, you win a miracle, right? So, so the, the, the process in, in getting understanding of whether this is a drug or not in terms of proof of concept is not that difficult. But the challenging really is that when you go to the, uh, uh, after that, you need to go to what we call a registration trial and you have a blind study in, in uh, separation patient into two arms. One, one arm with a standard of care, the other arm is with your new medicine. So um, I think by the time, to your point, by the time people see in the proof of concept, oh gosh, we got a very exciting new, you know, uh, medicine, proof of concept that works in a very difficult cancer, like a pancreatic cancer. Now we're in the clinical trials in the third, in the third last phase. Um, you're still looking at a, a year, a year, half, or two years before you can get it. Of course, people now, um, getting smarter, they wanted to join your clinical trials. But when you join clinical trials, obviously, uh, with the understanding 50% uh, of chance you're on the placebo, right? I mean, so that's that's the truth, right? But but you also have the 50% to get to the, on, on, on the drug. Um, but again, you know, uh, since it's clinical trials, so there's no guarantee that you, even though you're on the drug side, that you're gonna be, um, you know, benefit. So it's only after the clinical trials, after phase three studies, after the registration studies, all the data have been taken a look very carefully and uh, and the decision can be made that this is a new medicine that can cure the cancer. Globally, every year the number of clinical trials is increasing around 10 to 12 percent. At Seastone, Frank estimates the success rate of clinical trials from phase one to phase three is about 10%, which means bringing innovative therapies to market has its challenges. So what keeps you up at night? Yeah, so obviously um, when we are doing clinical trials that, uh, um, um, you know, how that patient uh, is responding to my to my uh, drugs, right? Are there any side effects? Are there things that uh, you know oh, I could do better to prevent that from happening? Uh, how uh, how is the hospital that we're engaging? Do they have the right facility, right people to helping the clinical trial? More, more on the clinical trial side, and uh, and obviously as the uh, uh, as a CEO of a biotech. Uh, that that headache is a little bit different from the uh, wake up in the in, in the in the night. So in China, when we do the biotech industry today, I think uh, one of the things that we're um, we're we're continue to worry about is the uh, talent. We need to have uh, people who can do the um, innovative medicine in China. I mean, you know, U.S. has advanced so many years, and we're starting the biotech industry in China. Um, and this is probably a lot we talk about, uh, you know, what happened in China all of a sudden from, a, you know, from a generic country into the, uh, into a innovative uh, field. Secondly is the data quality because, you know, relatively new and you need to have the people who understand how to do the uh, clinical trials. So therefore the data comes in, you believe it. This is actually a real data. The third thing that we're trying to, uh, you know, headaches or, or nightmare or, or whatever, is that uh, there's so many uh, in Suzhou Bao Bay, um, which is about an hour from uh, Shanghai, there, there, are, there are about 400 new biotech startup just overnight. Um, so how do you differentiate yourself uh, from one another? You know, PD1, PD1, you probably heard. Uh, in China, there are close to 50 of those. So, so where do you do with the, each other in terms of differentiation? Do you need that many in the how you differentiate? So that's the third thing, so differentiation. Last but not least is uh, there has to be a way to incentivize innovation. I just mentioned to you, the whole innovation takes $2 billion if, uh, if that's the case. Um, um, you can't pay them at the generic price. Right? You have to have a way of uh, recovering R&D and therefore um, people want to do the more. Um, you know, in the... Um, in the entire different industry overlook. For um, pharmaceutical industry, we're looking at uh, a healthy 15 to 20% of your income to, to the whole company's revenue to devote it into the R&D. Uh, let's use an analogy of car, 5%. Airplane, 
five to seven percent. So, so you know, uh, we 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 devote tremendous amount of revenue to do research and development uh, for better medicine, for better. You would you would you would think that car, you know, is, you know, is, you're running car every day, single day, and the safety is very important. You try to get to, you know, uh, get a, you should probably invest a lot more money to make us safe on the road, but. Um, if that's five percent is a standard, then, then you can see we're three, four times more. More than a century ago, physicians first recognized the potential of the body's own immune system to fight cancer. In the past couple of decades, researchers have made significant strides in understanding how to harness our own immunity for healing. In 2010, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved the first cancer immunotherapy treatment for prostate cancer. But science is advancing, probably remarkably, since you, you know, decided to enter the research field. Can you walk us through that? I mean, what have you seen, and uh, how remarkable is it? And do you, do you sit there and think, you, do you have a vision forward? Wow, in five years this could happen, or ten years this could happen, or is it too hard to do that? Yeah. I think that's a very interesting question. So what we're seeing today in the clinical setting, meaning in the patient bedside, uh, versus what we're seeing in the research, what we call bench site. You're absolutely right, uh, in the 1980s or 90s, uh, the science advances so much. We understand the molecular biology at very uh, detailed level. We can actually mimicking disease in the um, animal, in the rat. Um, when I was uh, at Eli Lilly and company, that was um, oh, in 20, uh, 2000, we had uh, um, tried to overcome a disease called a sepsis. Sepsis meaning a, a severe infection leading to the multiple organ uh, damage and, and, and eventually a patient died. Um, one of the uh, mechanisms is considering by severe infection. So we're actually mimicking a mouse model whereby the mouse will develop, the rat ma mouse, you know, will develop sepsis. And we're thinking this is because of the infection and, and, and therefore there is an inflammatory process. This is a little bit of mumbo jumbo of science. So we develop an antidote and we inject that antidote, this TNF, a tumor necrosis factor, um, to these infected uh, uh, mouse. You know, these mouse present just like a human sepsis. They have multiple organ failure and blah, blah, blah. And we're so excited and injected the, the uh, antidote you know, mouse survived. Oh my God, we, we were like a jump up and down. So now we have a miracle in our hand. This is 700,000 people's uh, incidents in the US. I mean, if you can get something like that, that will be like a brand new medicine. That's like innovation. That's the rewarding of what we do. We use that uh, um, medicine and we apply to uh, what we call clinical trials. Patients coming with uh, sepsis, and we trial them with the, the new medicine versus the standard of care. Guess what? Um, uh, we didn't uh, get to where we wanted. The, the study failed. Now that tells one thing. So the science has advanced a lot, tremendously. Um, but uh, our human biology, especially human disease biology, we, are, um, we have to be very humble that we know very little. They're very complicated. That's why today, uh, if you were to say overcome cancer, cancer is such complicated things. This is a detrimental disease. Um, probably is not one company, one university, one, academ one academia. Um, I really think this is a, a collective wisdom, a ecosystem. Uh, it really takes a whole mountain to get the system down. So science has advanced, but not to a point whereby it can overcome some very complicated issues.